Um, so um, this is probably more focusing on user space than uh, the previous talk. Um, so uh, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about mounting file system images in user name spaces, or basically actually any unprivileged uh, 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 user space, basically. Um, so the, the underlying problem that uh, we try to address with this is that uh, everybody wants to be able to mount uh, disk images that contain arbitrary file systems um, in user space. Uh, within mount namespaces without privileges, and that's a complex topic uh, to address. The, and the, the major problem, of course, is that kernel file system people generally do not uh, want to give these guarantees that a rogue file system image couldn't exploit the kernel. So uh, the big problem is that we have to establish some trust into the uh, file system image before we actually can do this, and then somehow uh, pass control to this uh, in, uh, uh, so that they can actually attach it to a to uh, their own file system tree inside of uh, their namespaces. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is basically uh, is some components we want to add to systemd. So with the ultimate goal that this is just available everywhere, at least everywhere where systemd runs, um, so that uh, uh, unprivileged user space, uh, like unprivileged user code, like for example container managers that do not run as root um, or any other kind of user tool. Um, can just make use of this um, and mount the file systems into their containers uh, without requiring SUID, without requiring any persistent uh, user ID assignments or anything like this. Um, yeah, um, specifically it's, it's about code running in a user's namespace can ask the host OS to mount a block file system of a regular file. So this is the, I mean, uh, yeah, this, the, the, this will require that basically every container can get access to some, in some limited form to some IPC interface is th that is available um, uh, uh, from the host. This is different than how containers uh, previously work since generally they only talk the, the kernel API and maybe in some limited fashion with the immediate container manager. In this proposal, uh, we would suggest that they also get access to, in a limited form, to some IPC to the host OS. Um, yeah, I briefly mentioned use cases are container managers. Um, there's also build tools that want to build images for containers. Um, Desk dev application runtimes that also want to be able to run apps of disk images. And basically any other tool that wants to deal with disk images, for example, just to enumerate that, uh, the contents of it. Yeah, the complexities um, are primarily establishing the trust and the integrity of the disk images so that they can't exploit the kernel. Um, uh, the focus is both on immutable images, where we have certain things like DM Verity uh, that makes things easy, but also writable images in some form. Um, it's uh, like the focus is also minimizing reaching over into calling nam namespaces, basically. It, we would rather avoid that we have to, um, from the host, enter the namespace, do some work there and things like that. And thankfully we can. And uh, yeah, we want to allow a certain level of recursion, right? Like so that you can have nested containers and it still works uh, in, a, in a reasonable way without any special cases or anything. Um, so uh, yeah, this, uh, the, the general concept of what we have in mind, and this was supposed to show up uh, one by one, but uh, this is a PDF now, so you now get uh, the wall of text here all at once. But the general idea is that you have an unprivileged client process P, which could be container manager or something like this, that allocates a user namespace U without any mappings. Then it talks to some IPC service that runs on the host provided by systemd, um, passes that FD to the user namespace uh, to it. That service then assigns a transient UID range. That's one of the key ideas here basically that we do not do um, persistent UID uh, range assignment anymore, but transient ones. So that basically as long as that user namespace that exists, it has that UID range assigned. Once it, uh, uh, the user namespace goes away, the UID range uh, can be recycled for something else. This is systematically different how user namespaces are currently used because there's always um, static allocation. Users get some stuff in Etsy sub UIDs or something assigned and then this stays for them forever, which doesn't really scale and it's generally a bad idea, I think. Um, so once they have now the user namespace with their transient user ID, they, uh, this, uh, the, this user namespace also comes with an implicit security policy applied so that anything that runs inside of that user namespace can only create files or do chmod and a couple of other things um, uh, on a whitelist, uh, allow listed uh, uh, set of uh, mounts and initially that list is empty. So they basically cannot create anything anywhere. Then it talks to another service which actually is capable of mounting uh, images. So it passes in a file descriptor to the 
image file it wants to mount, plus a file descriptor to the user namespace. That service then mounts something and returns a file system that is a uh, 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 file descriptor to an FS mount that basically has the UAD mapping already established that maps it back to the user namespaces uh, mapping. So the net effect is basically, yeah, this is an automatically allow listed in the in the uh, security policy that I mentioned. Um, so uh, yeah, so they basically can say, I have my image here, I want to be able to mount it, then I get the new style uh, 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 file descriptor back, and then they eventually just attach that to some location in the file system, and everything is in order, it always matches the, the transient user ID range that they got assigned, and everybody's happy. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the all there is to the concept. Looks like a, um, a, a lot of uh, steps, but actually for, for client applications, it's really easy. You just do one IPC call to get the username space um, uh, set up and do another IPC call to allow this certain mounts. Um, this is basically the same thing that I just said. Yeah? From uh, the client view, it just allocates the username space, asks the service for the mapping, then asks the other service for the mount, and then fetch it wherever you want. Uh, by the way, I put this in the strict order that you join the username space here at the end, but that's not a requirement. They can join the middle if you want. Um, to be more specific, I just call these two services X and Y, um, but actually it's implemented uh, in systemd on systemd user DBD and uh, systemd mount FSD. The reason I put this X and Y in there is because the concepts, of course, are entirely generic. Um, if people do not subscribe to systemd um, uh, view of the world, they can, of course, always implement this on their own very easily. Um, What's uh, particularly interesting is like the security policies that I mentioned is implemented with BPF LSM because we basically need to be able to say somehow that, uh, yeah, everything that runs inside of that user namespace um, has to go through that allow list of mounts. Um, BPF LSM actually makes that possible with one limitation, which I'll talk about uh, later. Um, the uh, disk images that we, uh, that systemd mount FSD implements actually follow this DDI spec, um, which so they can actually, because we, need to have the DM verity in them and the file system. So uh, the way this works is that we basically say, yeah, give us a GPT disk image, like a partition table, and have two partitions in it, the verity partition and the actual file system, plus actually a third one which contains the, 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 the signature for the root level hash. And then we'll go to the kernel, give the kernel uh, uh, the root level hash with its signature. The kernel verifies that against the kernel keyring. Um, we get the DM Verity device set up, we can mount it, we apply the UID map and give it back to the client. Um, so uh, by implementing this DDI spec, it's kind of easy because then people don't have to give us a lot of different resources. We just have one regular file which includes everything. Um, yeah, the big problem is of course establishing trust. I already mentioned that DM Verity is a big uh, part of uh, our solution there. So uh, um, yeah, if uh, you have a DDI image um, that contains file system and DM Verity and the signature, um, then we can just pass all of that together to the kernel. Kernel makes its decision and, and uh, sets the things up for us. Uh, another, um, like this is probably the primary way uh, to establish trust that uh, we can also add other stuff um, if kernel policy allows that like uh, trust by location so that you have it just a trusted directory and if um, some image was uh, uh, placed there, it's implicitly trusted. Um, so, um, yeah, if this is then some downloader can establish trust, verify everything, and then just put it there, and then it's trusted. It's, of course, a weaker model. Um, then the third one is writable images. DM Verity is not going to work for that, of course. So the idea is that, I mean, the, the, the bottom part doesn't exist. The rest actually does exist already and is implemented and will probably show up in the next system, these things. But the idea with writable images is basically would be that we use DM integrity, um, so that we have a, have a, um, yeah, we use it. We would use it with an HMAC um, hash function where the key for the HMAC is actually maintained by the system and is unaccessible to anyone else. This basically allows us um, uh, so that our little service can do MKFS um, with a sidecar file with the integ integrity data that nobody else can fake because they don't have this uh, secret key that we f uh, feed into the HMAC. Then uh, uh, user space can basically have its um, file system image and the sidecar image which contains the DM integrity data, and they can, anytime they want, come back to us, give us both things, and we can mount it again for them. But if they get rid of the sidecar, um, then the image is basically, yeah, we can't mount this for them anymore. 
Um, this, the, like the purpose of this writability is basically that a container manager that wants to build images can just go to us and say, hey, I want a disk image, um, please set up an XD4 image or whatever else of this size and then they can just do this and as long as they keep the sidecar around, they can mount it or and unmount it and mount it again as, as long as they want it. So. Um, uh, so let me just repeat this because the mic disappeared. But anyway, so the question was regarding uh, uh, whether signed FS Verity files could be used as well. I mean, right now the only the, the upper two uh, policies are implemented, but of course it's user space, we can add whatever makes sense. And uh, if it's DM Verity or FS Verity, it doesn't really matter as long as there's some way how, like ultimately my goal is always to let the kernel decide for, for, for like that it matches against the keyring instead of us doing um, uh, uh, trust enforcement user space. That's always worse. Um, but yeah, the send us a patch. <laughs> it sounds pretty uh, uncontroversial from our side. Yeah, so one thing that I think you could do is if you had an image file, uh, one of the things that your systemd mountfs uh, daemon could do is copy that file into a block device so that the uh, unprivileged namespace doesn't have access to the block device and then run fsck on it so that you know the file system is consistent because a lot of the security concerns were about a maliciously um, you know, modified file system that would trigger a kernel bug. And so if it passes FSCK um, and then you mount it, no SUID, no dev, blah, 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 um, you might be able to give the container uh, a writable image without having to use DM integrity. Right, Inter just a thought. <laughs> Interesting. It's, we actually do call FSCK uh, on it uh, in the yeah. writable case already. So this basically is already given. But it was news. To, it was news to me that this is a philosophy that file system uh, engineers subscribe to. That that an FS check can uh, establish trust. I mean, uh, it, that's somebody is shaking the head. Yeah, so it's, apparently it's, it's not yeah. a universally. Yeah. So it's going to depend on the file system but and for how XD4, much. For XD4, for XD4, you would say FS check is enough to establish trust. Yes. I, 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 am okay. I am reasonably confident that it is <laughs> not possible to maliciously corrupt a file system such that you could cause a buffer overrun or some other kind of privilege escalation attack in the but kernel. Um, like, like, like an exploit. Yeah, what, about, yeah. what about algorithmical problems, right? Like that they uh, modify the data structures enough so that they are still valid, but uh, runtime performance is just terrible. So. I don't know if this might be a yeah, I mean, form you of could, attack you like can, a DOS. Yeah, you might be able to get something, like you could heavily fragment the file system such that access to that file system would be slow, right? But that's not a privilege escalation attack. So this sort of depends on what your threat model is. Um, and so, yeah, obviously, you know, this is a policy configuration question. Um, but but if you have a sufficiently paranoid uh, FSCK, um, then yes, you can make that. Now, you could imagine someone being so paranoid they don't even want to allow that, right? But I'd actually be pretty confident about that. Uh, it's for that's very good to hear. That yeah. sounds like, like something we actually should implement then. So with an allow list of file systems, I guess. I mean, I'm just overly pessimistic, right? Like I, I think that, you know, do I trust that our FSCK is going to give you like a valid file system? Yes, of course I do that. But like I also understand that I am not perfect and that there's likely to be something that's is messed up in the kernel that the FS check doesn't necessarily capture or vice versa, right? So like, I mean, I think it's a good solution, right? But like when you're talking about like, you know, a high security environment, like I wouldn't use it as the, the source of truth, right? Uh, I'm sure it's not a high priority for you, but have you thought about network file systems being a high priority? But uh, allowing a user, allowing unprivileged users to allow to mount a network file system. In, in particular, I think that in particular, we, we just added TLS support to to. Uh, but that to sounds much less risky, doesn't it? Like it basically. I mean, Ooh. one thing that we certainly want to add is that. Uh, <laughs> no, not well, at I mean, all less risky. So um, uh, one thing we certainly want to, to, to enable is that you can pass into the service a, a file descriptor to some arbitrary directory and we will then generate a bind mount, apply UID mapping to it and give it to you, right? In that case, that is relatively riskless because, I mean, it's already mounted, right? 
Um, so isn't this network file system thing something like that? Like, do any of the n network file systems even implement UAD mapping right now? Uh, I'm not sure how well it's done. NFS UID mapping, yes, but that's a totally separate concept. Uh, the one that you are interested in, no. But I have, uh, I had posted patches for uh, CephFS, and uh, it worked fine. There it was just that the server implements restrictions based on the caller's um, FSUID, and so uh, there would need to be uh, a few more modifications, or uh, uh, more inode operations would need to be uh, made aware of um, these ID mappings. But the patch set works, and uh, someone constantly keeps pinging me about it because they keep running it in production. So, so the, I mean, a, a, a malicious server is just as bad as any malicious disk image. So uh, we do want to probably have some restrictions there. But in particular, we just added support for TLS to the NFS server. Uh, and when the, the client doesn't have it yet, but, uh, but that might be one way you could do this. You could just say that we're only going to allow you to mount you know, things that are have a certificate in there, you know, that yeah. is you know, signed by someone. And then there are auto mounts. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, cross domain. Yeah links and all sorts of things you can find on network file systems. Yeah, I mean, you could do the same kind of thing with, uh, you know, SMB, you know, in, in the Windows example supports quick, but, you know, you, if you have an encrypted connection, maybe you allow it. Um, but, but, but I think the UID mapping thing is super important because there's two parts to this. I don't know of any sane way, maybe you do, of, of how to uh, do UID mapping centrally. I mean, RFC 2307 doesn't have a concept of containers. That's different. That's a different problem. That's yeah, that's a separate question. But, but, but anyway, back to the question of mounting, of, of ID mapping, the Hyper-V guys years ago added um, ID mapping inside for containers, for, I mean, for the Hyper-V to the SMB protocol. And if it's something that would help you, I mean, there's, there's a container ID mapping inside the protocol. We just never cared because so nobody ever asked for it. So, uh, I mean, basically, this daemon is entirely generic, right? Like, and it will have one method where you pass in the regular file, and then we'll do our thing. But, I, I, like, this is, I, I have no illusion this is going to grow and add a couple of features sooner or later. So, if the mount, uh, like, mounting network file system is a thing that people want, then you can absolutely add this, um, as long as there's some kind of sensible security story in place. Um, anyway, let's, let me finish with my... Uh, uh, Slides here. I don't know how much time actually have I probably ran over already a long time. I don't know. Okay, so uh, the unsolved problem in one is that is that the, the security policy is implemented with LSM right now, and that doesn't allow restricting ACL manipulations. So uh, basically, that means I mean, we really don't want that if I allocated a username space that I can use that uh, with a transient mapping that I can go through that to write my user IDs. Uh, uh, to some other file system, and we can block that all out except for in ACLs. Uh, maybe it's not a big problem, but it is a problem. Um, so the way this currently works, and uh, stop me as soon as I uh, tell you, uh, give uh, stuff away, is uh, <coughs> it, it allow lists based on mount IDs. And uh, so uh, m there are path hooks already in most of the VFS, for better or for worse. And uh, the only ones that don't have a, a take a path, e even though that's not necessarily a problem, is just the VFS underscore set underscore ACL method that I added. Um, and once you have uh, you have that, uh, that shouldn't be a, a problem um, uh, as well. Yeah. But yeah, from a security perspective, I think this is the only vulnerability, but it's not a major one, I would say, because it doesn't. It doesn't. It's, it's not about owning resources. It's simply by like they're gonna be a little bit to lose if, if people can do this. So I'm not too concerned. Um, but yeah, this stuff works, um, uh, and I can demo it. Uh, unless there's anything else we want to discuss first, but otherwise, let's just go with. So uh, uh, the demo basically consists um, of me running here the user DBD like the thing that allocates the username spaces, um, the, the user namespace ranges on one window. And I need to type in my password correctly. That's the hard part. Oh, just put the plug in there. Ah, oh, there we go. 
So uh, it's not particularly interesting. You just see that it uh, registers all the BPF LSM stuff. And then in the other one, we start the mount FSD, which is responsible for actually mounting Spamsync. What's interesting to know is that the, the user DBD is going to run inside of every container because it needs to be able to hand out um, uh, user ID ranges that are valuable in the specific container. The mount FSD is running on the host because it's the one that actually does the, the stuff. But that's the reason why there are two daemons instead of one. Um, yeah, so we have this running now. And then uh, we use the third one now. And uh, so this is a tool, systemd dissect is a tool that uh, is just part of the systemd tool set. It, all it does is look at inside of a disk image and give you like a manifest of what's in there. Um, and this one, uh, yeah, runs without privileges, it's Leonard. Um, and if I run this, it just works. And it shows you all the right um, user IDs. So if you, like this is actually user ID zero, it's not some kind of nobody 655 whatever uh, user ID, so this just works. And in the background, what you can see if you look at this is that there are two IPC requests made, one to get the assignment here. Um, so here you see that it gets, rah. Yeah, well, it's just scrolled away. But anyway, um, so you see the two IPC requests. And on the other one, you get another one. And that's really it. And it's extremely simple. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a showcase how all the recent kernel additions <laughs> actually can, can be extremely powerful because it uh, uses the new mount API and uses that across uh, namespaces, right? Like we uh, allocate the mounts in the host um, uh, file system namespace set it up entirely there, and then we only attach it to the destination namespace in the last step. Um, it also uses BPF LSM, which is like the new hot shit, um, and does a couple of other things. So it's, yeah. Ultimately, I'm kind of happy because it's tiny. It's socket activated, so it doesn't even run all the time. And the way uh, how delegation works into containers is basically, uh, um, yeah, for the mount FSD thing, it's just one socket, and you're supposed to bind mount it into the container, and that's like to one specific location and slash run. And that's basically all that's necessary to, to uh, allow this stuff. Um, and there's nothing further configuration-wise or anything. It will automatically determine everything from the username space that you pass in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really simple because it's just one IPC call you do. Anyway. Uh, an advantage is, um, for example, I think I mentioned this before, the uh, super block <coughs> isn't owned by, well, yeah, the super block namespace isn't owned by the user namespace you're mounting that file system in, which means all of the destructive IOCPLs that you uh, have on a ButterFS file system or on an XFS file system aren't available. So you can, you, you know, you give it an XF, uh, XFS mount or a ButterFS mount, but they can just you know, fuck up the file system by using some sort of weird IOCPL, I don't know, defrag or whatever. Um, but they own the mount, which means they can unmount it. Um, because the ownership of the mount is separate from ownership of the um, super block, uh, which I think is a um, nice side effect because another thing to the another consequence of making a file system mountable inside a user NS is you're basically saying you own the super block and you get to do all things with the super block that you want, which is uh, usually also an additional attack vector. So, so this is something I thought of after you'd moved on from the slides, so I, I guess I have a question first. In any of these scenarios, um, when you're mounting on behalf of an unprivileged context, th does the unprivileged user have the ability to modify the underlying raw file system image? Uh, so it gets the ability to change whatever it wants because the files are ultimately owned by that unprivileged user, right? But because we the, the security policy is supposed to be that we um, enforce DM verity, yeah, it will result in EIO and hopefully but the kernel file systems can deal with that part. But if the user can modify it after the file system's mounted and you've already done the verification, then you have another attack vector for the unprivileged user. Sure, but I mean, this is what DM verity is supposed to deal with, right? Okay. I'm, I'm or not super familiar or with FS Verity so. or DM Integrity with an HMAC or, yeah. Okay. I mean, and, and the, in the case, what, what Ted said about the FS check stuff, right, like he mentioned this already, that we would make a copy first. 
we would have to have make a copy first because otherwise um, this uh, attack is of course there. Okay. Sorry, can I log? If you've got a file that from an underprivileged user that they want you to mail, can you just lock that file against changes? The mandatory locking? I saw that it was kind of uncool these days. But anyway, yeah, so FS variety, DM variety, whatever, like it solves that, that issue properly. Um, going back to network file systems, one aspect is um, the network namespace that's used. Is there, would it be trivial to pass like the net network namespace FD as part of the create mount for a network file system? Well, I mean, I guess that's up for the network file systems if they can even make use of this. NFS right. can. Yeah, but I, mean, I don't know NFS, but um, you probably would have to have an extra mount option where you tell NFS, oh, by the way, do it in this mount namespace, uh, network namespace. But this is probably something you should discuss with the net NFS people, because I have no clue about that. Yeah. If I recall correctly, you just inherit whatever network namespace you're in when you call the, when you do the mount. So I so I guess as long as system D switches the network namespaces, you should be able to do that. Yeah, but the new mount API, you can just add a thing to say, here's a, an FD for the the network namespace you want it to be in. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it captures it when you create the super block. Yes. Well, we can add, add an option to allow that to be overridden. Uh, yeah, and anyway, the goal is, uh, I already mentioned this, it's just going to be in systemd so that people don't have to argue about this and it's going to be enabled by default. That's also the goal. So that, uh, um, yeah, it's just there and if people don't want to use it, it's their own fault. Anyway, uh, that's all I have.